morning. Good morning. Welcome to South Haven First United Methodist Church. We're coming to you live from 723 Star Landing Road East. It's good to see everyone in the house of the Lord on this beautiful Palm Sunday. I remind you that next Sunday is Easter Sunday and look forward to seeing you here in church next Sunday as we celebrate our risen Savior. Just a couple of announcements that I want to highlight. Uh, Bible study will continue this Wednesday night at 6 o'clock and then again Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. And there's going to be a, uh, a sorry, Monday Thursday service uh, Thursday night. I'm going to let Brother Sam tell you more about that when he comes up. Uh, yesterday there was a pop-up sale and, and a bake sale uh, here at the church and I'm going to let Cheryl tell you a little bit about that. Oh, I got a lot of that. His name is Jehovah Jireh. God provides. Amen. We have so many generous people here at this church, and I want to thank each and every lady, each and every person that donated. We were so successful for our little group. We raised $309.07. We had a great turnout, actually, and it was kind of limited. It was kind of windy, um, but we had a great turnout. The women enjoyed, you know, speaking to all the visitors that came in our parking lot. But we do have some leftover goods, so we're still raising money. So if you are interested, there are some baked goods still for sale. Cheap, you can cheap, just a donation, because we need to get rid of them. They're baked goods, right? Um, so uh, I appreciate everyone, but we also had another donation today um, of a, an Afghan, is that what I'm right? A baby Afghan, and there's two more for sale. Um, we're asking um, a donation of $40 for the Afghan. They're beautiful, handmade. They're little baby Afghans, and they're beautiful. So anyway, that's another fundraise on, for the women and the church. But Ruth also, for the building fund of this church, raised around $248. So praise God for that. Yeah, we pray. We got out here about three, 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 I'm not sure exactly. But um, thank you so much again. And did you want me to say something? Uh, you said 309. There's more. And I'll give you all an update. But at least that's a beginning. And that's a good start for the little group. So thank you again so much. <laughs> I mentioned to you that next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and uh, Brother Sam, if you'll tell them a little bit more about uh, um, what we're going to do next Sunday. I don't see any birthdays listed, but I happen to know there are two birthdays. I know of one. I know of one. That's two. That makes two. I know about Bill Ross having a birthday today, so Bill is here, so be sure and wish him happy birthday today. I asked him, I said, Bill, how old are you today? He said, 59 plus. <laughs> so, and, and Judy Fuller has a birthday today. She is here also, so be sure and wish both of these people happy birthday today. <laughs> Any others this morning? Our first hymn this morning is, in the hymn is number 77, and it's How Great Thou Art. And I want, to stand, I want us to stand and sing verses 1, 3, and 4. I want to hear you sing. Sing out, please. <laughs> Oh, 
was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross reconciles all things to God. Amen. Before we go into our prayer time, like I said, Jim has asked me to just share with you. This is Palm Sunday coming into Holy Week. And this Thursday, we're trying to get back into as much of an old schedule and routine, the way we used to do things. And one of the things that we used to share together as a church family was that Monday, Thursday, Holy Thursday, where we would come together. And we remember the night before Jesus is arrested in the garden. And taken away to be crucified. We'll come together. And it is a very hard service. A mournful service. As you want to put it that way. But it is also a very special. Unique service. We will come together. And look at a number of different. Bible passages from the Old Testament. New Testament. And then from the Gospels. And we will have a message together. Then we will serve Holy Communion. And then what we'll do is we do what we call the stripping of the church, where all the different things are taken away. And then we dismiss ourselves by walking out in silence as we remember, you know, the hardness of this night for Jesus. But then we'll be coming together on Easter Sunday. And what we're going to do, what we had done in the past is you'll be invited to come. We'll be serving communion between 930 and and 9.55. I'll have a table set up front right there. And you'll be invited to come in anytime between 9.30 and 9.55. You just come in, walk up to the front, receive the body and the blood, the, you know, the bread and the juice. And then you're invited to go back to your seat and just remain there in a time of silence and time of prayer, preparing yourself. And then at 9.55, we'll stop that and get things ready at 10 o'clock. Then we're going to have our Easter morning service, okay? And that will be at 10 o'clock. So it is a little different this week and everything. The Monday, Thursday service at 6, and then Easter service starting at 10 o'clock with communion at 9.30 before that. So be sure to mark it on your calendars. And those that have been watching us at home, we invite you to come and also be a part of this special week with us. So hope to see you here as well. Or if not, I do know everything will be broadcast, as always, on our church Facebook page. Now, as we continue to go into our service, as always, we want to continue to lift up all the needs of our church family. Continue especially to keep Miss Sue and Mr. J in your prayers. Miss Rosie still having some troubles with her back. I know there's so many others. I'm always... Ashamed to do this because I'm always going to forget somebody. But anyway, God remembers who we all are. So continue to be with all these needs now that are before us. And I invite you, if you will, to just take a moment now. 
to go into this time of silent prayer, lifting up whatever needs that God is placing on your heart. And as we pray silently together, Beth Ellen, as always, is going to play for us now and take us as one to the throne of grace. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, once again, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for moving in our midst, and thank you for hearing our prayers. But more importantly, thank you for being the one who is still in the business, as always, of answering our prayers. We place all of the needs of our hearts and of our church and church family into your loving, life-giving hands as we now place ourselves there also. And once again, use this service for one purpose and for one goal, and that is to bring us all together to the foot of the cross of Jesus. So bless us now. You lead us and you guide us. As once again, we come here now to worship and praise and celebrate you. And also be with us now. As together in one voice, we lift up the beautiful, spirit-filled prayer that Jesus himself has given to us. So hear us now as we pray as one. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen and amen.
Father, we come now. Our pilot lights have been lit. Through the beautiful music and the reminder of the old rugged cross which you, Cheryl, to do for us. Now, dear God, we come and with lit power, light, power lights, we, or pilot lights, we also now come to be anointed with your spirit so that the fires will begin to start in our hearts and in our life. So, dear God, come now. Come now and set us on fire for you, dear God, so that we can be your church and your people as you're calling us to be. And as you move in our midst, as always, give me that double portion so that I can proclaim your message for us today with a truth and a boldness. It's not from me, but from you. But greater still, dear God, as we now come together, I pray, dear God, that through the anointing of your spirit that our eyes will be open so that we can see Jesus alive, standing now in front of us, welcoming us, leading us into your presence. The greater still, let it be the voice of Jesus now that we hear. So once again, it will be your word given to us. And I ask all of this now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. According to Greek legend, or Greek mythology, the Greek gods, Zeus and Hermes, were once arguing over the level of devotions that humans had toward the gods. To settle their argument, they both disguised themselves then as two poor servants, and they came down from Mount Olympus so that they could walk among the people unnoticed and see which one of them was right. And so, temporarily, Zeus and Hermes took upon themselves the outward form, disguising themselves in this outward form as servants. But in reality, they were not servants. They were merely wearing the disguise of a servant. In our scripture reading for this morning that I just shared with you, Paul is now telling us, telling each and every one of us exactly how different Jesus is from Zeus and Hermes, other than the fact that Jesus is the one true living God, while Zeus and Hermes are nothing more than false or fake gods, okay? But there's something else he also wants us to know. Paul also wants us to know that in comparison to Zeus and Hermes, in comparison to them, that Jesus has done more. Done more than just taking on an outward form or outward appearance as a servant. You see, Jesus did not put on a disguise. What Jesus did was to take upon himself the complete nature. The complete persona, the complete identity of a servant. But the thing is, it's just like the way that the people did not recognize Zeus and Hermes in that tale of Greek mythology. Neither did the Jewish people at this time. Neither did they recognize who Jesus was. You see, they did not recognize who Jesus was. Even after they heard all the things that he came to tell them, to teach them about the power of God's love and the power of God's grace and his mercy and the power of God's forgiveness. Neither did they recognize him. They didn't recognize him as they witnessed. They witnessed all the miracles that Jesus performed, such as giving sight to the blind, helping the Death to now hear once again. Or most importantly, giving life to those who were dead. And neither did the millions of people. The millions of people who are in Jerusalem cheering Jesus as he comes riding in on a donkey or on a colt, whichever one you prefer. 
He comes riding in on a donkey or on a coat there into the city of Jerusalem on this day that within the life of the church we now call Palm Sunday. And it was on this day. It's on this day then when the people lying in the streets cheering on the one. The one that they believe was now going to become their new and their true king. Cheering on the one who believed, they believed was now going to be their worldly warrior king. Cheering on the one they truly believed would be the one that would lead them and lead their armies. The Israelite armies against the armies and the nation of Rome driving them out of the land. But what the people do not understand, what they have failed to see is this. That the one, the one who is now riding before them into Jerusalem on this day, he is now coming with the power. A power that is greater than the power of some warrior king. No, the one who is now riding before them, he comes with the power of the true king of kings. Coming with the power of a servant. And so for us now, this morning, this Palm Sunday, we now need to ask ourselves this question. How do we keep from being like those people? How do we keep from being like those people who were in Jerusalem on this day praising the King of Kings for all the wrong reasons? How do we keep from making the same mistake that they did? How do we now recognize Jesus? Not making their mistake, but recognizing Jesus in our lives for who he truly is. Well, to do this, to see the true Jesus, Paul is now telling us something very specific we need to do there in verse 5. To see the true Jesus, he tells us there, you must have the same attitude. The same attitude of Christ himself. But now, to you, what does it mean? What does that mean to have that same attitude of Christ himself? Well, for me, it simply means this. It means that you have to have the mind of Christ by following the example of Christ that he lives before us. Following the example of Christ that he lives before us each and every day of our lives. And so to help us do this now, Paul in this passage is sharing with us three ways. Three ways that we can now follow this example of Christ so that we can have not just the same mind or the same attitude, but more importantly, we can now see the real Jesus in our lives today. So what are they? Well, look at verse 7. There in verse 7, Paul tells us that Jesus gave up his divine privileges. Well, what does that really mean? Well, in the Greek, in the Greek it is translated to mean this, that Jesus, he emptied himself. He emptied himself. And for Jesus, this means that he had to empty himself of all his glory as God. He removed, emptied himself of all the glory of heaven and of God that is within him. But with Jesus, we must also understand this fact. That when he emptied himself, he did not do it with any kind of regret in his heart or in his mind. When it came time to go, God did not have to push Jesus kicking and screaming out the door of heaven, folks. He didn't have to push him kicking and screaming with Jesus screaming out, calling out, Hey, Father, isn't there something else that we can do? Is there another way that we can do this? Why don't you send Michael or Gabriel or better yet, send Abraham? He's been wanting to visit family. Why don't we send him? But he did not do that. The preacher tells us he did it another way. The preacher, the author of Hebrews, he tells us he did it with joy. In Hebrews 12, 2, the preacher writes, Who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And so for us then, 
The same way for you and me that we must have that mind of Christ, it means that we also now must empty ourselves. Empty ourselves also of our wants, any personal wants or desires. But now, always understand this. That when it comes to emptying yourself, we're not supposed to walk around living our lives each day as empty shells or vessels. We are to fill ourselves in the same way that Jesus filled himself. What does that mean? I've always loved this story of Dwight Moody, the great evangelist. Dwight Moody once stood in front of a group of people, and he held up this clear drinking glass. Looking at everyone that was there in front of him, he asked them this question. How can you remove all the air from this glass without shattering? Well, there were a number of different suggestions of how to, you know, vacuum out, remove that air from the glass. But each and every time they made a suggestion about bringing all that, sucking all that air out, Dwight Moody showed them, he let them know that that would cause the glass to shatter. When they were running out of suggestions, Dwight Moody then brought in a pitcher of water. And with that pitcher of water, he filled the glass up to the very top, the rim of the glass. You see, when Jesus emptied himself, he did not remain empty. When he came into this world, he emptied himself of all of his glorious God. What he did, he made a choice. Instead, he filled himself up then with a different kind of glory. He filled himself up with the glory that comes with the heart and the mind of being a servant. Of being a servant. And friends, this is the problem. This is the problem why so many people miss seeing and meeting the true Jesus. That instead of being filled with the glory of God, they are too busy being filled up with themselves. Too full of themselves. But let me ask you this. Could this be our problem also? Could this be my problem and your problem as well? The question is, what do we need to do? What do we need to give up? Not in the season of Lent. That's in coming home. What I want to know is, what do we need to give up now within the season of our lives? So that we can truly, completely empty ourselves so that others can now see Jesus living within you, living within me. What do we need to do to empty ourselves so that more importantly, we can see the real Jesus that work in our lives each and every day. He emptied himself. We must empty ourselves as well. The second one is in the first part of verse 8. We're told Jesus humbled himself. Once again, what does this mean to humble yourself, especially in Jesus' case, to humble yourself before God? For me, it simply means this. It means that within your relationship with God, you have to take a look, folks. You need to take a look and see who is number one in that relationship. Another one of my favorite stories is a story about Hudson Taylor the great missionary to China. He was once asked to come and speak at one of these huge, large churches in Melbourne, Australia. When it came time for him to speak, the pastor, very excited to have Hudson Taylor in his church, got up there and introduced him as our illustrious guest. When he got through, Hudson Taylor then walked up to the pulpit and there was a huge round of applause for Hudson Taylor. But he just stood there looking out upon the congregation. When they finished and everything was quiet, Hudson Taylor spoke up and this is what he said. Dear friends, I am not some illustrious guest. I am but the little servant of an illustrious master. You see, we must humble ourselves. How do we do this? Well, I know I've told you before about me and Sandy and the agreement we made when we first got married. 
I know I've shared this with you before the way that we pledge to love God. To love God more than we love each other. And I tell you the reason why, the reason why we've always done that is because we now understand. We've understood that the more love we give to God, that means the more love that He can then give back to us so that we can then give that love to one another. I know I've told you that, but I haven't told you about the other thing, have I? I don't think I've told you about this, about the other promise that we made. We also made this promise that together we were going to make God be number one in our lives and in our marriage. <clears throat> we did this, knowing that would mean what? To make God number one in my life means I had to make Sandy number two. And her the same for me. But you see, once again, we've been together 40 plus years now. And we did this knowing this one thing, this one thought, that even though it would be strange, it probably sounds strange to everybody else to say that I love God more than I love my wife, and I've got God number one and Sandy's number two. It's going to sound strange to a lot of people. But what we've discovered is this. When you put God in His place, then everything else in your life will also fall in place. You put God in His place, everything else in your life will also fall into place. Bigger still, you discover, you discover what is really important in your life. But at the same moment, discover what is not really important. In your life. You see what I'm about to say now. It's going to be then one of the simplest things that you're going to hear me say in this sermon. But it's also going to be one of the most powerful things. It's going to be one of the greatest truths that I will ever say to you. No matter how many sermons I preach to you. And this simple but powerful statement is this. You see, we need to make God number one because you and I are always going to be number one to Him. We need to make God number one in our lives because to God, you and I will always be number one. And sadly, this is the reason why so many people still do not see Jesus, who He is. They don't see Jesus because they're too busy being focused upon themselves. They're looking at themselves first and their own wants and their own needs. Could this be something you and I are also guilty of? Are we also guilty too many times of looking at ourselves first? What could you and I give up? What do we need to give up in our season of life so that we can truly humble ourselves and Others can see that we are putting Jesus first in our lives and in our relationships, but better still, so that we can learn how to see Jesus for who he really is in our lives each and every day. Is Jesus number one in your life? Which brings us to the third one, the last part of verse 8. Jesus was completely obedient to God. Now, just how obedient was Jesus to God? Paul tells us he was so obedient, he was willing to die a criminal's death. Now, what does all this mean? Now, you know this. I've shared this with you before. Now, according to Jewish belief, when you are out there and you're being blessed in your life, you're getting everything you needed, everything was going great, you just won a hundred and million dollars, from the lottery, and you didn't even buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> Everything's going great. That means you're being blessed by God. And God is now smiling down upon you. But if you're not being blessed, if everything is going wrong in your life and you win that $100 million lottery on one night and at 6 o'clock the next morning, the IRS is banging on the door getting ready to take the whole $100 million away from you, then that means you've done something to make God angry at you. 
You've lost God's favor and God is no longer smiling down upon you. But you see, that's not the worst thing that happened to you. According to Jewish thought and belief, the worst thing was to die a criminal's death. You see, to die a criminal's death is more than to be punished. It means that you are so bad. It means that you have done something so terrible that God has now turned his back on you. And when this happens, it means that you are more than just being rejected by God. It means this. It means you have now been cursed. Cursed by God himself. That's why we must know Jesus did more than just take our sins. Jesus also took our curse upon himself. The curse of being banished. From the presence of God. Why do you think. That when he was on the cross. Why did Jesus cry out. My God. My God. Why have you forsaken me. Because he taken our curse. He not only took our sins. He took our curse. Upon himself. That's why we say. Jesus gave the ultimate sacrifice. He paid that ultimate sacrifice. Because he was willing to go all the way so that we would not be banished from the presence. Being obedient so that we can also now see the true Jesus. Who he really is now living in our lives. So what do we need to give up in this season of our lives? What does all this mean? Now it's at this point. It's at this point you probably expect me to conclude everything by now asking you something. A question like... So how do we give up these things? Or you expect me to ask you, well, what are the things we need to give up so that we can truly empty ourselves, humble ourselves, and be obedient to Jesus and to God? But that's not the question, folks. That's not the question that I want to ask you. That's not the question you and I, you need to ask yourselves. No, the question I want to conclude all this with is why? Why do we need to do all this so that we can become empty, humble, and obedient to God? But most importantly, so that we can now have the mind, the attitude of Christ. I want to conclude this by sharing with you from this book, Hot Illustrations for Youth. It's written and compiled together by teacher and author Wayne Rice. In this, he shares a story called only a donkey. The donkey awakened, his mind still savoring the afterglow of the most exciting day of his life. Never before had he felt such a rush of pleasure and pride. He walked into town and found a group of people by the well. I'll show myself to them, he thought. But they didn't notice him. They went on drawing their water and paid him no mind. Throw your garments down, he said crossly. Don't you know who I am? And they just looked at him in amazement. Someone slapped him across the tail and ordered him to move. <laughs> Miserable heathens, he muttered to himself. I know what I'll do. I'll just go to the market where the good people are. They will remember me. But the same thing happened. No one paid any attention to the donkey as he strutted down the main street there in front of the marketplace. The palm branches! Where are the palm branches? He shouted. Yesterday, you threw palm branches. Hurt and confused, the donkey returned home to his mother. 
When he got there, she looked at him and said, Oh, my child, don't you realize that without him, you were just an ordinary donkey? And then he concludes this with this paragraph right here. Just like the donkey who carried Jesus in Jerusalem, we are most fulfilled when we are in the service of Jesus Christ. Without him, all our best efforts are like Filthy rags that Isaiah tells us about in Isaiah 64, 6. And they amount to nothing. When we lift up Christ, however, we are no longer ordinary people, but key players in God's plan to redeem the world. Now, I'm going to be honest with you and tell you something. I have no idea why God told me to use this closing story. I don't know what the purpose of it is. And I don't know which part of this story might be the part that's actually speaking to you. I imagine for most people it's that closing paragraph that I read here. Concludes with that line. When we lift up Christ, however, we are no longer ordinary people, but instead key players in God's plan to redeem the world. I think we can all agree that that is both a beautiful and a powerful statement. But I guess... My God wants me to tell the story and use the story because that line doesn't mean anything for me. That doesn't appeal to me. That's not what does it for me. What stands out for me and what speaks the most in the story to me is what the donkey's mother says to him. Oh, my child, don't you realize that without him, you were just an ordinary donkey? You see, I, don't, I no longer want to be just an ordinary donkey for Jesus. I want to live as someone who serves Jesus because he was willing to come into this world and first serve me. And I know that to do that, I've got to give up the things in my life that hinder me from being a true servant of Jesus. My pride, my selfishness, my fears, my wants, or to simply put it, I've got to give up doing things my way because I don't want to be an ordinary donkey anymore. I want to do this so I know no longer in my life make that same mistake either that the world continues to make and not see the real Jesus before our eyes. And more importantly, so the world can see the real Jesus now within my own life. But there's another reason why I don't want to be an ordinary donkey anymore for Jesus. Because I want to be ready for that day when Jesus comes riding back on a white horse. And suddenly the world sees the true Jesus for who he really is. And by that point, it's going to be too late for a lot of people. But not for us ordinary donkeys. Not for those of us who claim the power that Paul tells us about. I do this in the name of Jesus Christ. The name that is above all other names. The name upon which every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth will bow and every tongue confess on that day that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen. So what's it going to take, folks, for you and me to give up all this stuff so that we can truly empty ourselves and humble ourselves and become obedient? Because this is a great week. Today's Palm Sunday. We enter into Holy Week. We've got Holy Thursday coming up. Good Friday following that. And then the best day of all, Easter Sunday. Are we just going to go through it all as an ordinary donkey? Or are we ready to step up and do what it takes to not let just people see Jesus in us, but for us to begin to see the real Jesus at work in our lives? You at home now. Bow your head where you are. Let that couch, let that recliner be your altar. Kneel on the floor. Because we've got an altar here for you that are with us in person. All you got to do is come up to this altar and kneel or stand before the one and say, I want to see the real you, Jesus, in my life every day. So what's it going to take to make this truly a season of our lives? So let's close it all out. There, with our closing hymn, in the garden, we'll sing the first two verses of this great old hymn. And once again, 
You're invited to come either to this altar or this altar. You're invited at home to make an altar of where you are. And so if you're ready, you want to come on and go ahead. Come on up here and join Jim and Beth Ellen as they're praying. If you want to come on now, we'll be singing in a moment. Don't let that stop you. Don't let it change your mind. Come on now if you want to. We're going to sing that great old hymn in just a few moments and offer ourselves now to him. So let's stand. It's 314 in the hymnal. If you're like me and you like to hold the hymnal in your hand. We'll sing those first two verses. Jim, Beth Ellen there in the garden. and sisters of Christ. Go forth now in the love and peace of our Lord and Savior. Go forth now to empty yourself, to humble yourself, and to live a life being obedient to the one who came and emptied himself, humbled himself before his heavenly Father and was obedient all the way to the cross to take our sins and our curse upon us. Go forth. Live your life so that others can see Jesus, but more importantly, so you see him as well. And all of God's people together said, Amen. Amen. I want to thank you at home for joining us. Thank you for being a part of the service. Don't forget, once again, we have our Holy Thursday service, Thursday at 6, and then Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. We're going to have that starting at 10 o'clock. So I invite you to join us on our Facebook page. Until then, take care, God bless, and goodbye.